body. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I'm joined in the studio by my producer, Joel. And today we are diving back into the Warren files to bring you the absolutely bizarre and creepy case of a man named Bill Ramsey, also known as the South End Werewolf. This is a quite a bizarre story, I, I gotta say, uh, that involves the Warrens, exorcism, and all that good stuff. So that is what we're diving in today. And before we get into that, though, I have a couple announcements I wanted to make or sort of follow ups to some of the things I've announced in previous episodes. First off, our Halloween merch drop is coming on October 29th. I'm very excited about this one. I absolutely love all of the designs. They were all handpicked by us and our designer has been working on this stuff for the last couple of months. So we put a ton of work into it. We hope you guys like the designs. I'm really excited about it. I think you guys are going to love them. Uh, based on the feedback from last week when we sort of unveiled the design seems like you guys are really really excited about it so again there's gonna be a very limited quantity of each of these designs and items so if you want to get your hands on one then you better be ready to go midnight october 29th when this collection goes live and just for those that have never bought merch from us all of our merch ships worldwide uh, so it doesn't matter where you are we can definitely ship you our latest merch collection Again, that's at milehiremerch.com. Also on the topic of worldwide shipping, my CBD company, Higher Love Wellness, which I've talked about here on, on the show many times before, we have actually just been given the go ahead to begin shipping orders to the UK. So all the countries that are in the UK, as well as Australia, New Zealand, and Mexico. Beginning Saturday, October 23rd. So if you visit higherlovewellness.com on Saturday and you're somebody in one of those countries, you should be able to go through and place an order. We did our best to find the most affordable international shipping, but unfortunately, obviously, it's always going to be fairly expensive, but we've made sure that it's good shipping at least. So we can make sure that we get your order to you safely and without any issues. And again, if you're a listener of the show, we're giving all of our listeners 10% off all the time with code lights out at higherlovewellness.com. We have a ton of different stuff, delicious gummies to tincture oils to CBD dabs. And, and hopefully in a couple of weeks, we'll have CBD vapes back up on the store, which I'm very excited about because we had to take those away for a little while because of some government bullshit. But now we've got that figured out and that will be available hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Plus, we've got a lot of other stuff coming this year. So if you haven't checked us out yet or even understand what CBD is, definitely take a look at higherlovewellness.com. CBD can literally benefit every human being, basically any living being at this point. CBD definitely can help in a lot of different ways. So more information on my website, but let's go ahead and get into this absolutely crazy case. This episode of Lights Out is brought to you by Canva, Blender's Eyewear, and Talkspace. So Bill Ramsey grew up in a small town by the sea in South End, London. He loved his gentle summers, and he often spent his evenings running around the backyard, picking up sticks and throwing rocks. He lived a relatively normal life with his mother and father in their quaint home, where the sea breeze would blow in from the south and push his mother's daffodils around her garden. She watched him play from the kitchen window and always made him wash his hands and face before coming in for supper. On a hot day in 1952 at the young age of nine, Bill Ramsey's life changed forever. Out in his mother's garden, he kicked at the stones and picked at the weeds. He whacked sticks against the fence posts, and in his childhood days, a burst of freezing air came over him. It was far too cold to be a breeze from the sea on a hot summer day, because it was so cold that it felt like his sweat had literally frozen. He felt a strong urge to run away towards the beach and live with the wolves. But right before this overwhelming urge took him over completely, he heard the distant call of his mother to come in and wash his hands and face because it's time for dinner. As he trudged back to his home and dipped his hands into the cold reservoir, a massive weight came down on him. Bill felt an intense rage building within him. He had never felt it before, but since that day, that rage would continue to grow. And soon he lost control of himself. The friendly, simple boy he had been started to fade. He threw himself back out into his mother's garden in a fit of anger. He had the urge to destroy, and he couldn't understand where these emotions came from. But he also couldn't deny them. Bill marched over to the chicken wire fence that his father set up around the garden. 
and with superhuman strength, he grabbed onto one of the wooden fence posts with his bare hands and uprooted it from the ground. It was a large wooden post set in concrete, and Bill picked it up as if it was nothing. His parents watched from the kitchen window in horror as something demonic possessed Bill with adrenaline-fueled strength. He swung the fence post around like a club and smashed the concrete end on the ground. Once he destroyed the fence post, he threw its remains to the ground and then curled his lips, revealing his shiny teeth. He took hold of the chicken wire mesh and began chewing at it like an animal. The cold chill he had felt before returned, and Bill let out a nasty growl into the air. He finished gnawing through the fence as his parents just stood there in utter shock, and they wondered what had happened to their sweet little Bill. Despite his bursts of rage and superhuman strength, Bill Ramsey went on to live an ordinary life the best he could. For nearly 15 years after this fit of rage in his mother's garden, his anger disappeared. He grew up to be a simple wood joiner in the field of carpentry, and he worked as a skilled craftsman and built doors, windows, and staircases in a local workshop of Southend. He also married and had three children, and they even bought a dog named Shadow. And throughout his domesticated life, Bill tried his best to control his feelings of rage and the animal urges that overcame him. He tried to bury these urges and demons deep inside, but they continued frothing at the edge of Bill's psyche. The freezing chill of that fateful day back in 1952 had often come back to haunt him, and reoccurring nightmares pestered him throughout the first few years of his marriage. In his reoccurring dreams, he crept behind his wife in a field of fog. Crickets chirped, and the two of them walked alone in the middle of the woods. Closer and closer, he sneaked behind his wife, and as he drew near, he reached out to her. Only a few steps ahead, she quickly turned around to face him, and with her piercing eyes, she stared right into him. As he turned to run, a sudden burst of energy forced him out of sleep, and when he woke up, he was back in his dark bedroom. He lay on his back in a cold sweat, gasping for air, heaving with feelings of anguish and dread as a cold chill came over him. Not only was he tortured by his afflictions when he was awake, but he couldn't even hide from his anxieties in his dreams. Luckily, by 1967, when Bill was 24 years old, his nightmare ceased. He finally thought his terrors were over. The nightmares had ended, and his strange fit of anger when he was a young boy became a distant memory, until one night, almost a year after his nightmare had subsided, another deep anxiety lingered. As he lay beside his wife in a pitch black bedroom, he had the itching feeling that something was wrong. Someone else, or something else, was in the room with them. Bill couldn't see anything, but he heard the deep panting of something ferocious. All he could hear were the heavy breaths of a wild animal looming somewhere in the room. As Bill sat up in the bed to prepare himself for an imminent attack, he realized what he was hearing was his own breathing that was scaring him so badly. His deep inhales and exhales sounded like the panting of a desperate wolf. After this, another 15 years passed without incident. Bill shrugged it off as the days passed by and he did his best to maintain his composure around his friends and family. The freezing chills had disappeared, and he hoped he had seen the last of them. On a casual weekend in 1983, Bill went out with a few friends to have some drinks and relax after a long week at work. After drinking a few pints, instead of feeling warm and fuzzy, the freezing chill took over once again. That familiar feeling from all those years ago came back to haunt him. He stumbled towards the restroom as he felt his rage build inside him. He slumped over the bathroom sink and he looked at himself in the mirror and he saw the image of a wolf. It was his face, the face of Bill Ramsey, but his eyes were distorted and he had hair of a wild wolf. He escaped the bathroom and told his friends he needed to go home as soon as possible. His friends were obviously very confused, but agreed, as he could see that his friend Bill wasn't feeling well. Bill stood over the table and clutched at his chest. Sweat poured down his face. And on the drive home, Bill's animal urges bubbled to the surface. He couldn't control himself any longer. He began growling as he sat in the passenger seat of his friend's car. 
His shoulders rolled forward and his lips curled upwards. His hands twisted into claws and he lunged at his friend. He aimed for his leg where he took a clean bite. And as soon as he did this, his friend screamed in absolute horror and pulled the car to the side of the road. All the while fighting off Bill as he tried to maintain control of the steering wheel. He swatted at Bill and tried to force him out of the vehicle, but within a moment, a sad, confused look came over Bill's face. He suddenly had no idea what had happened or what he had done. A blank space filled his memory. He quickly apologized to his friend and walked the rest of the way home in absolute confusion. Unfortunately, Bill's outburst would only get worse from here. About a year later, during the holiday season of 1983, chest pain struck Bill out of nowhere. Like needles into his heart, he thought he was having a heart attack. So he checked himself into the local hospital where they gave him a small room. And as he sat and waited, he wasn't sure if it was an issue with his heart or if the horrific urges came to control him yet again. A young nurse came into the hospital room to check on his blood pressure. She attached the blood pressure unit to his arm and began to pump it with air. And not halfway through the procedure, Bill's veins began to bulge under his skin. The boiling rage that he tried to keep bottled up began to overflow. Completely blindsiding him and the nurse, he once again transformed into a vicious animal. He revealed his sharp teeth and looked at the nurse with bloodthirsty eyes. Leaping from the hospital bed, he grabbed the nurse and sunk his teeth into her arm. She screamed in panic and the hospital staff with an earshot quickly ran towards the hospital room. Bill released her from his clenching jaw and then headed towards the door. He escaped the hospital room and charged down the hallway like a madman, growling and panting as he ran. Drool slung from the corners of his mouth and he barked at the hospital staff. He fought off several people who tried to subdue him and it took the strength of three people to finally tackle him to the floor. A police officer was able to rush in and get Bill handcuffed, but still it wasn't enough. Bill flailed violently and flashed his teeth. It wasn't until they injected Bill with a tranquilizer when he finally calmed down and faded into a deep sleep. By the following day, Bill was back to his old self. He ate a hearty breakfast of eggs and hash browns and chatted politely with the hospital staff. And when a doctor came to ask him a few questions, Bill appeared reasonable and well kept. The violent animal that they had all just witnessed the day before was now gone. The doctor recommended that Bill stay in the hospital a few days under observation, but he declined. And as a patient of his own free will, Bill was allowed to leave. Bill appeared in control and healthy, despite his outburst from the day before. And the doctor couldn't do anything else besides suggesting Bill seek professional help. And within two months of the incident, Bill found himself back in the hospital under the same conditions. A severe pain began in his chest, and the drops of cold sweat began to form on his head. Bill clenched at his chest and the veins bulged in his neck. The attending nurse came into the room and saw Bill in critical condition. Something was clearly wrong, so she told Bill she would go find a doctor as fast as possible, but not before Bill exploded with rage. He threw the nurse to one side of the room and then lunged at a nearby orderly. By chance, four police officers were down the hall and saw a commotion coming from Bill's room. They sprinted down the hallway, and as they turned towards Bill's room, they saw him on all fours. Bill gnarled his teeth, revealing a bright, demonic smile. He growled at the approaching officers, and when they got close enough, he thrashed himself towards them. After a short tussle, the officers were able to handcuff him, and again, Bill Ramsey lay on the hospital floor, handcuffed and thrashing around just like he had done the previous time. A pattern of violent outbursts began taking shape. As they hauled him back to the squad car, the beast within Bill faded away, and by the time he sat down in the back of the car, he returned to normal. A calm temper washed over him as if nothing had happened. On arrival at the police station, they ordered a police surgeon to take a look at him. The doctor suggested that he check himself into an institution, and although Bill took it under consideration, he just couldn't do it. The social stigma of being institutionalized was a shame that Bill couldn't handle. So in the end, he declined. And again, he was released. It wasn't until his next transformation that he would finally reach out for serious help. 
A few years later, in July of 1987, Bill decided to blow off some steam and drive around town. The fair was in town, and people were out and about, spending their midsummer days in the warm weather of Southend. He gripped the steering wheel tight as a familiar wash of cold air overcame him. It had been years since his last transformation, and he thought they were finally through. But nope, they returned to haunt him. In a shady part of town with nothing better to do, Bill picked up a prostitute that was far too young. Noticing her age and not knowing what to do, he drove to the police station and made a citizen's arrest of the young girl. As he brought her inside the station, the waves of rage began building inside of him. One officer greeted them in the entrance and took the girl into custody, while Sergeant Terry Fisher took Bill outside to ask him some questions. As he began questioning Bill, Terry looked into his eyes and they began searing with anger above a sinister smile. His lips turned upwards and he showed his teeth like a wolf just before pouncing on its prey. Bill said to the officer, the devil is in me. When the devil is in me, I am strong. I am going to kill you. I am strong and you are going to die. In a blaze of anger, Bill jumped straight towards Terry's throat but he quickly dodged the attack. And in turn, he sent his knee as hard as he could straight into Bill's groin. Bill crumpled over and gasped for air, but within seconds, he recovered. The blow barely fazed him. His strong, assertive posture returned. His hands turned into claws, and he tackled Terry to the ground as Terry screamed for help. Bill reached for Terry's throat, and he wrapped his hands around his windpipe. He then tightened his grip around Terry's throat and the light in the officer's eyes began to fade. On the brink of death, Terry felt his body go limp and just before he fainted, he watched his fellow police officer side tackle Bill, separating his vice grip from Terry's throat. Terry heaved and gasped for air as the other officers tried to maintain Bill. It took five officers total to finally subdue him and once again, Bill found himself in a familiar position on the floor and handcuffed by police. The officers booked Bill immediately and quickly gave him a drug test. And to the officer's surprise, the test came back negative and they couldn't detect any level of intoxication. With a fear that Bill would harm any of the others in jail, they threw him into an isolated room with no windows or bars. A heavy metal door sealed the cell and only a tiny window not even the size of a piece of paper was Bill's only access to the world beyond the room. And unlike the episodes before, Bill's fury had it worn off. He still threw himself around the cell and growled at anyone that came by. Like a wolf caught in a trap, he tried to escape by any means necessary. He somehow managed to force his head and one arm through the tiny window, but he quickly became stuck, and he whipped his body around in violence. The frantic police officers had to tranquilize him, cover his head, neck, and arms in liquid soap, and pull him back through the window. After Bill woke up, he once again returned to his old self. Bruises covered his body and he sat in the cell with sadness and confusion. He knew he was prone to fits of rage and loss of control, but he had never gotten this far. Bill began to fear himself and wondered how much his wrath would intensify. After the incident, Sergeant Terry Fisher took early retirement and left Bill's case with Inspector Belford. After he looked over the previous incident, as well as several other outbursts at the hospital, Inspector Belford saw that Bill's pattern of violence continued to escalate. He was a danger to himself and others, and Belford believed that if Bill were to walk free again, he might end up killing somebody. No criminal charges were brought against Bill, but he was finally committed to a mental hospital. And after this happened, Bill's life became a mess. Swarms of reporters asked him a slew of questions, and his story had become a public spectacle among Southend. In the papers, he was a local villain, and his reputation was forever tarnished. And by now, with so much shame, Bill was desperate to cure whatever afflicted him. Over a series of weeks, he underwent a long series of psychiatric tests, brain scans, and evaluations but nowhere during the process could doctors identify what was wrong with Bill. They could not pinpoint the cause of his erratic behavior either, and after they tried everything they could, they once again released Bill back into the public. 
and all their roads led to a dead end. And for the following weeks, Bill became so scared that he might hurt someone, that whenever the chill came over him, whenever his chest began to throb in pain, he would drive himself straight to the police station and ask to be thrown in a cell for the night. Being in a cell was the only place that Bill felt like he couldn't hurt anyone. But soon enough was enough, and Bill started to think he would be in and out of hospitals and jail cells the rest of his life, and he just couldn't take it anymore. The psychiatrist had already tried to help him and failed, and the most the police could do was just throw him in jail for a night or two. After he had exhausted all of his other options, he reached out in desperation to the only people he thought might be able to help him. And I bet you can guess who those people are. Ed and Lorraine Warren. Before we get into what Ed and Lorraine suggest they do in order to help Bill, we're going to take a quick ad break and we'll be right back. Making content is an essential part of what I do to keep this show going, but it hasn't always been a seamless creative process. But ever since I found Canva Pro, I can design anything like a pro on any device. Canva Pro is a design platform that empowers you to create and share stunning content in just a few clicks. Designing with Canva Pro is amazingly fast and fun. You can choose from thousands of templates that are easy to customize or start from scratch. With Canva Pro, you have endless premium fonts, photos, videos, and so much more that add personality and edge to whatever you're designing. Here at Lights Out, we use Canva Pro for our thumbnails, and I gotta say, it has come in clutch so many times for us when it comes to photos and just the templates that they have that are already set up for YouTube. Makes making thumbnails or any other banners or icons or images for social media that much easier. Designing together has never been easier and sharing, editing, and commenting in real time is all possible with Canva Pro. It also helps you stay organized on the same page and on top of team projects. Plus you and four teammates can unlock everything Canva Pro has to offer for just $12.99 a month. With Canva Pro's content planner, you'll save time planning, creating, and posting social media content too. Pause scheduled posts and edit them at any time. I gotta say my favorite Canva Pro feature is the fact that they give you images that you can use so you don't have to go out and find them. And also having all the templates for all the social media platforms is super, super helpful and makes it so much easier to work with. Design like a pro with Canva Pro. And right now you can get a free 45 day extended trial when you use my promo code or link by just going to canva.me slash lights out to get your free 45 day extended trial. Again, that's C-A-N-V-A dot M-E slash lights out. Again, that's canva.me slash lights out. I'm also very excited to be working with Talkspace. Talkspace Online Therapy can help you manage stress, process significant life changes, and more. So you can feel less overwhelmed and more in control. Therapy is literally great for everybody. I mean, everybody needs that third-party person sometimes to talk to you about whatever it may be. Therapy has been such a helpful thing for me personally, and I know many other people who have gone through extensive therapy and have really, really come out better on the other side. The people around us make a huge impact on our lives and life's pressures can cause those relationships to change for better or for worse. So whether you're having complicated feelings about a relationship or you just need a neutral person to talk to, Talkspace Online Therapy connects you to a licensed professional to help you work through it. And as the year ends, another holiday season is upon us and for many of us that means travel and family. Tis the season to be jolly, but sometimes it just doesn't feel that way, and that's okay. Ease some of the burdens the holidays can bring with Talkspace Online Therapy. No need to drive anywhere, you can literally get your therapy online so there is no excuse not to give it a try. The fact that you can talk to a licensed therapist and schedule a session on your schedule is super, super convenient. And Talkspace is truly secure and professional, so you don't have to worry about any of that. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform, and there are thousands of licensed therapists available for you to match with across dozens of specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationships, and more. So if you need a little support to help you through the end of the year, you want to start building towards a better upcoming year, Talkspace is here to help. Match with a licensed therapist when you go to Talkspace.com and get $100 off your first month with the promo code lights out. That's one word. That's $100 off when you use code lights out at Talkspace.com. 
And our last sponsor for today is Blenders Eyewear, the only sunglasses brand I'll ever wear again. And here's why. Fresh out of San Diego, California came Chase Fisher, who started Blenders by selling his beachy shades out of a backpack while doubling as a surf instructor. And his goal is to create an adventurous mid-price eyewear option with the same cool factor as the other leading styles. I gotta say, this is what makes Blenders Eyewear, I think, stand out from all the competition is the fact that you can get literally any style that you would ever want and maybe there was a style in a larger brand that you absolutely love. Well, I guarantee you that Blenders has something very, very similar that you'll love just as much. And best of all, you'll love the price even more. Blenders team of in-house designers are constantly coming out with new styles, which is really cool, from orange polarized wraparounds to tortoise shell frames with purple lenses to classic gold arms on black lenses. And it's not just sunglasses. Blenders has prescription glasses, readers, and blue lights as well as a snow collection with goggles and accessories, which I can't wait to try out their snow goggles this snowboard season. So live life in forward motion with Blenders today. To score 15% off your Blenders purchase, visit BlendersEyewear.com and enter promo code LIGHTSOUTVIP. That's BlendersEyewear.com. Use code LIGHTSOUTVIP. Again, all those are one word together for 15% off. With Blenders, you're rocked with pride worldwide. So Bill Ramsey is very concerned about his mental health. He's concerned that there's some type of demon perhaps that's possessing him to cause him to have these outbursts. So he starts searching for anybody that might be able to help. And that's when all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, Bill found and contacted the legendary paranormal investigators, Ed and Lorraine Warren. He had heard over the years of their specialties in paranormal activity. And after realizing all the physical treatments hadn't worked, he figured that it must be something spiritual or supernatural that was at play. He told the Warrens his tale, dating all the way back to that summer day in 1952. He told them about his intense emotional reactions and constant loss of control, especially over the past few years. At first, Ed thought the case was a bit too silly, and it might hurt the Warrens' credibility, but Lorraine persisted. She knew Bill was desperate for help, and she eventually convinced her husband that Bill might be possessed by a demon. Once they got to know Bill, they realized he was a pleasant, well-mannered guy. He was polite, honest, and forthcoming about his problems. So when they heard about his transformations, they were shocked. After some research, Ed and Lorraine were convinced that Bill did not suffer from mental illness. They believed he was possessed by the demonic spirit of a wolf. In other words... They believed Bill was a werewolf. They explained that what he was going through wasn't like the movies, and there was no magical transformation into a hairy beast under the full moon. The folklore of werewolves dates back to ancient Greece, and the affliction has been explained in many different ways by many different tales. But Ed and Lorraine Warren were strongly convinced that Bill suffered from some type of lycanthropy. His intense rage, loss of control, and urges to bite people were all similar to the afflictions of a werewolf. Many different reports of lycanthropy span across human history. They range from the physical and mental transformation into a deranged wolf, where the person is driven by bloodlust and a taste for human flesh. Others claim it's a severe mental illness where a person has convinced themselves they are a werewolf. Many believe that people like Bill suffer from an intense delusion but the Warrens believed otherwise. No one knows for certain how someone turns into a werewolf to begin with, and for Bill it was like a demonic wind passed through him. Some stories tell of being bitten by a werewolf and then turning into one, while others say you can simply wear the skin of a wolf to transform. According to legend, you can recognize a werewolf by the hair connecting the eyebrows, hair under the tongue, or hair within the flesh and many say the eyes of a werewolf glow with a bright shine. But in the case of Bill Ramsey, none of these applied. Aside from his physical contortions and his hands forming into the shape of claws, his appearance never changed. He never grew extra hair and his eyes never glowed. Ed Warren explained to Bill that what he suffered from was the possession of a spirit. His affliction was internal more than it was external, so the problem had to be driven from the inside out. In medieval Europe, where the most common folklore of werewolves began, there were three known remedies to lycanthropy. Medicinally using a flowering plant called wolfsbane. Surgically by physically removing the body parts that morphed into a werewolf. 
or by exorcism, where a priest would banish the demon from the body. Many of the medicinal and surgical remedies often killed the werewolf and the person they embodied, and performing these types of treatments was far too outdated. So Ed and Lorraine suggested the exorcism was the best route for Bill to take. At first he scoffed at the idea. He called lycanthropy and exorcisms a bunch of rubbish. But as the weeks went on and his condition worsened, he eventually caved to his desperation. He figured it was worth a shot since nothing else had helped. But there was only one problem. Bill needed to travel from Southend all the way to Connecticut for Ed and Lorraine to manage and supervise this exorcism. And since Bill was a simple carpenter with not much money, he couldn't afford the travel expenses. Luckily, Ed, Lorraine, and Bill used his recent local celebrity status to his advantage. The story of Bill's lycanthropy had reached local tabloids and eventually made its way around the world. Publishers couldn't get enough when it came to the werewolf of London. So Bill sold his story to a British newspaper for $20,000, which was more than enough to fund his trip to the U.S., And in July of 1989, 37 years after that fateful day in his mother's backyard, Bill Ramsey and his wife made it to Connecticut. They desperately hoped that all this would be worth it, and that this long, horrific journey would finally be over. It was a hot summer day, much like the day he had first experienced that cold chill in his backyard. Ed and Lorraine had managed for Bishop Robert McKenna to perform the exorcism. Father McKenna was from the local church of Our Lady of the Rosary Chapel in Monroe and Ed and Lorraine trusted him well. If there was one person that could drive the demonic spirit of the wolf out from Bill, it was Robert McKenna. But no matter how professional Father McKenna conducted the ceremony, exorcisms were always extremely dangerous, not only for the person possessed, but also for the priest performing the exorcism. And knowing that Bill Ramsey was prone to extreme violence with superhuman strength, they took proper precautions. Bill entered the room where the exorcism was to take place, and he sat down in a small fold-out chair before Bishop McKenna. Six bodyguards armed with stun guns surrounded Bill as he readied himself for the exorcism. Bishop McKenna, dressed in a long white bishop's gown, held the Holy Bible in one hand and a rosary in the other. He slowly approached Bill, made the sign of the cross in the air, and began reciting prayers in a quiet but firm voice. Minutes passed and nothing happened. Bill sat quietly with his hands clasped as the bishop continued reciting prayers and Bible verses. The energy in the room was calm and quiet, and for another half hour nothing happened, but soon the energy in the room began to shift. Bill started to fidget in his chair. His face contorted and the muscles in the back of his neck began to enlarge. The veins in his forehead began to bulge. Upon seeing this, Bishop McKenna stood his ground, expecting the best but preparing for the worst. The rage and violence within Bill gained traction. His lips curled and he showed his teeth. The bodyguards stood at the ready and gripped their stun guns. All the while, Bishop McKenna maintained a steady tone throughout the ceremony. He wouldn't allow the demon to intimidate him, and any sign of weakness would enable the wolf's spirit to gain confidence. At every sign of the cross the bishop made, Bill would wince in pain. Something seemed to be giving away and the bishop did his best to maintain his ground. Bill's shoulders slumped forward and his hands turned into claws. He swiped at the air as he grimaced, and with each sign of the cross, Bill felt a sudden surge of energy pass through him. Bishop McKenna began to see that the exorcism was working, and a small window of opportunity opened up. As Bill winced in pain, Bishop McKenna took his rosary and placed it around Bill's neck, and after this simple gesture, Bill blacked out and didn't recall anything from the rest of the exorcism. The entire process took about 40 minutes, and as Bill slowly collected himself from the traumatic process, he felt a renewed sense of life. Something that died within him long ago had finally been resurrected, and as far as he could tell, the exorcism had worked. After a brief thank you and a farewell to the bishop and the Warrens, Bill Ramsey returned home to Southend. He returned to his family as a renewed husband and father. And from that day forward, Bill has not suffered from a single violent episode, and his intense fits of rage have stopped. The ugly throbbing muscles, the curled lips, and the hands that twisted into claws are now things of the past. And whether Bill suffered from mental illness, or if he was genuinely possessed by the demonic spirit of a wolf, 
We will never know for sure. But there's one thing we do know. It's that the exorcism performed by Bishop Robert McKenna seemed to heal Bill Ramsey from whatever afflicted him once and for all. Bill Ramsey made his last public appearance in 1992, stating that he's been doing very well ever since the exorcism. And his skepticism towards spirits and exorcisms as a whole have changed completely. After his long, troublesome journey, he believes that whatever consumed him during those fits of rage and violence surely had to be the work of the devil himself. So that is the story of Bill Ramsey, the South End werewolf. What do you think? I'm going to have to say I'm very skeptical of this case. Yeah, uh, I have a few reasons. I mean, first of all, Bill Ramsey, just his appearance alone kind of looks werewolfy. You know, he just kind of looks, it's hard <laughs> yeah, to explain, but when, point. when you look at him, it's just like, okay, he, he kind of already looks like one. And two, when Ed and Lorraine Warren, I think they did capitalize on the opportunity because, I mean, they were, they were probably thinking the same thing. You know, Bill looks like a damn werewolf. So let's go check it out. It's a good out. story, yeah. Yeah, and, and what's hard is like when do researching, and there's like zero pictures of Bill when he was transformed into a werewolf, which I would think would be the most important piece of evidence that Ed and Lorraine Warren could do, does not exist. You know, and they, as far as we know, I mean, what, what I mean, the Warrens have always claimed that they have the evidence, they have the footage, they have all this stuff, but mm -hmm. it's kept under lock and key for whatever reason. Yeah. So that people, I don't know, I don't know what the reason is exactly. Mm -hmm. It's either to protect their work or something, or it's just complete BS and it's just, yeah, to it, cover up the fact that there is no proof. For sure. And, and like my last reason for why I'm skeptical. So Bishop, you know, Father McKenna has worked with the Warrens a few times. And his most famous one was during the Smurl family haunting, which he did attempt an exorcism. Right. Based on what I've read, he like he has he's attempted so many exorcisms and has failed miserably in lots of them. So what sticks out to me is. Once he gets involved with Ed and Lorraine Warren and then is working with like Bill. like a whole conspiracy here. He's like, yeah. he successfully does an exorcism on Bill where afterwards, like he doesn't turn into, a, he doesn't have any more episodes of over. Werewolf. Yeah. And yeah. That, that's just like hard for me to believe, you know? Yeah. It, it's, it's definitely one of those that you really have to take their word for it. Or otherwise, <laughs> yeah. otherwise you just reject the whole story yeah. as a whole. And you're like, Bill just sounds like some crazy dude mm -hmm. that thought he looked like a wolf from a young age or liked to pretend he was a wolf <laughs> yeah. and then got the brilliant idea of becoming a werewolf or right. acting like a werewolf. I mean, there's a couple, couple different scenarios here. Like, first of all, this could be just Bill, having a crazy imagination thinking he is this werewolf. I mean, sometimes people think that they're, you know, some type of creature or something like that. Yeah. It's not totally unheard of for, for that to happen. Um, I mean, lycanthropy is basically a mental disorder where the patient believes that they are a wolf or a non-human animal. I'm pretty sure this is a clinical disorder that people are actually, diagnosed yeah. with like because i mean there's been people all over time who have said they're this or that they're a vampire they're you know and just yeah. because they exhibit some of these things then you know or they feel like they look like one or something that they feel like they become one and so you know is yeah. it possible that he just thought he was one in his head and that maybe he had some sort of mental illness where it kind of amplified that. I mean, you could look, you could say all people who are demonically possessed are not actually possessed by some sort of supernatural entity, but in fact are just mentally ill. Right. And have some other type of condition that, you know, is, is ailing them that mm -hmm. they just don't, don't know about. My, my only argument for this disorder, if, if Bill had it or not, is how did the exorcism work? If, it truly was mental illness that after, you know, that whole <laughs> session they had, he was finally never reported again to have another episode. I mean, that's 
that's just what's hard if, yeah. if Bill really did have yeah. the disorder because he would continue. And my thought on that is maybe afterwards, Ed and Lorraine Warren might have paid him under the table a little bit <laughs> to say, hey, look, like keep I, your mouth shut. Know. You yeah. can't be yeah. a werewolf anymore to protect us that are exorcism. That's our part of worked. the deal for us getting involved is like, yeah. yeah, I mean, a lot of people think that that's what the Warrens did is like they just they took advantage of situations and people who are in in particular situations that made for a good story and then just took that story and and juiced it up and then kind of sold it to people yeah and i think i think in probably most cases with them i would say that's probably what what happened but i do believe there are a few cases that the warrens are involved with like you know, the case of, uh, you know, the haunting in Connecticut with that yeah. family. And, you know, the devil made me do it. Yes. David Glatzel. Yeah. That one was a, a very interesting one where yeah. like it could go either way still with those. Like it could just be mental illness being confused for demonic possession. Mm -hmm. And again, it just also you got to think about what your views are. Do you believe in supernatural entities that can possess people and can cause people to do things? Or is it just the human psyche doing crazy things where you know a person just doesn't have control over it maybe or they just have a very you know a big yeah. imagination like bill ramsey seems to have because like that's what i'm saying too is i didn't see a lot of as far as we know though i mean it's it was hard to drum up information on this because the only oh, yeah. information that you can find is literally from ed and lorraine warren's book <laughs> yeah. about this particular yeah. story so you know you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt but i wonder because i'm like okay so if bill ramsey was possessed by a demonic wolf spirit well how right. when did that happen because the whole story seems to begin in his backyard his parents are watching him all of a sudden he's like mm -hmm. exhibiting werewolf symptoms you know right. it's like right. where you know where where does the spirit come into it maybe perhaps there's some type of the you know spiritual presence on the property mm -hmm. That possess. I mean, you could probably point to a million things. Was he on some type of burial ground of some sort? Right, right. I mean, who knows? But yeah. but then again, this type of behavior where somebody exhibits, you know, symptoms of of being a werewolf is just not that common either. No, it's not like not all. the common way people are possessed, no. right? So, to me, it seems like there is a high chance that this was kind of all a hoax, like kind <laughs> yeah. of all just concocted to create this like cool story because then again yeah. like where's the proof of him biting the nurse yeah. where's the proof why wasn't he like why isn't there records of this why isn't there like photos from exactly. police reports showing that he attacked and that's the thing with the warrens is just like it's hard to where's, where's all the evidence verify yeah. the story yeah and we have to kind of really just take it for what it is and then you either believe it or you don't so yeah. That's kind of where we'll leave this one is right. like, do you believe Bill Ramsey's story or do you believe that this was just a giant hoax and, you know, the Ed and Lorraine Warren saw the huge opportunity to write a book about it, make a bunch of money off of it, which and that's the thing, too, is I'm like, well, how much money are Ed and Lorraine Warren making off their books? Right. Like, you go look at it on, on Amazon. They're not selling that many books. No, so but it's like. But I can't believe in this case, you know, Bill went to the media and was already making like twenty thousand dollars, however much was reported. Right, right, that's insane. A lot of money. Yeah, you know, so especially if for Bill's men. getting that, and Ed and Lorraine Warren are the ones who like hosted the whole thing. They got to be getting a big cut. Yeah. So yeah, and then there must have been enough for it to make it into the media too. Like yeah. obviously, tabloids will pick up wild stories and stuff, but usually there's something to them. Yeah. So maybe, you know, maybe somebody saw him acting crazy, acting crazy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to think about seeing this dude on all fours, like dude, I, barking and growling and like would, would, running, uh, running through the hospital. I would like, think this dude be tweaking or something. Yeah, it's like who gave this dude some PCP or something, man? Maybe he's, he had some uh, salvia before he right. fucking. Because like tripping the balls, yeah. Dude. Th that's the thing too. Is I'm like, oh, I just wonder if this dude like maybe he like as a kid like stumbled upon some like yeah. some fucking <laughs> mushrooms or <Right>. something <laughs> like just uh. caused him to like go into this funk and he thought mm -hmm. he was this and then he just replicated that or he had this learned behavior of where he was like <laughs> you know when he get angry and feel yeah. this like 
rage come over him. This is just how he expressed it because it was something that happened in his childhood. Like, I bet you a a psychologist or a therapist, like, I bet somebody with (laughs) mental health experience would be able to, like, pick this apart and be able to point to this is probably what happened. So I think I think likely this had nothing to do with a spirit possessing him or making him do this, but rather Bill (laughs) just fucking (laughs) dealt with trauma or dealt with his his rage and anxiety and anger by exhibiting characteristics of a werewolf Mm -hmm. and i truly think father mckenna did nothing to help this situation he read some bible verses and then he put a rosary (laughs) around his neck and all fixed like what come on man like that's too hard to believe yeah it's it's very iffy but Uh, i gotta say my first i didn't learn war in case i'm really skeptical about yeah i would say the skeptic meter's going off for sure i mean it's hard to really believe this one but I want to know yeah. what you think out there because, you know, maybe there's something we're missing. Maybe there's another angle to this that we're just not quite clear on. But definitely let us know your thoughts on this episode. I thought this one, I mean, the thing about Ed and Lorraine Warren, you, you got to give them credit. They make some fucking good stories. They like, do. They are, ex, they are exciting to listen uh-huh. to. They really grab you and pull you in and really make you truly believe in this paranormal world that exists and like yeah. i believe in the paranormal i think there is things that happen that Absolutely. we can't explain there's there's obviously more going on than what my eyes can see and my ears can hear yeah. right there's stuff happening that i mean we've had proof here on the show of orbs and yeah i mean there's sh- there is a spiritual realm uh that exists i believe and you know i i just think that there's a lot of people that rather than facing that from like a very like purely i don't know perspective try to try to claim that they're experts on it or try to claim Mm -hmm. that they know what's really going on and claim that they have these connections to this other realm and are able to explain things so i mean you got to take ed and lorraine for for what they are and what, what you think at the end of the day i mean everybody's got different opinions on them i think they've got some great stories and had some very interesting experiences with some very interesting people (laughs) clearly in the case of bill ramsey but but yeah i mean they're just they're fun to dive into and Mm -hmm. you know there's endless more stories out there so if you want to hear more from the warren files definitely let us know but we will wrap up today's episode there hopefully you enjoyed this episode of the lights out podcast if you did we'd appreciate if you subscribe to us on apple Podcasts and youtube it really does mean a lot we put out a video version of the show on youtube every single week uh, which Joel spends a lot of time on, so he'd love it. Yes, if you check that out. Uh, he he's you know adds the creepiness to these these episodes, oh, which yeah. is always fun. Hopefully, give you you know get those hair standing on the <laughs> back of your neck. And also a quick reminder: if you're looking for something else to fall asleep to or just watch and relax, check out Planet Sleep. Uh, we got 11 episodes up to date, lots of spectacular content. Uh, so yeah, just please check it out. Yeah, yeah de-stress from this episode and go listen to <laughs> our latest planet sleep on rocky mountain national park beautiful stunning place oh yeah very relaxing and no werewolves <laughs> no but that wraps things up today for this episode of lights out and we will see you next time but until then lights out hey, everybody, everybody.